Today, I want to introduce Joseph Bartoloni, a registered dietitian. As Rick mentioned, I'm a registered dietitian. Um, and yeah, I've always um, been interested in, you know, the in gut health. That was my, my first kind of um, introduction into the field. Um, and then the more and more I got into it, the more I got interested in the gut brain connection um, and working with different uh, neurodegenerative diseases and um, other conditions with the brain and the gut. Um, so I'm just gonna share my slides now and go a little more into that. All right. So yeah, as I, just a little about me and, you know, my humble beginnings. Um, first, when I, at a very young age, my dad died of a heart attack. Um, that was how I got into the field of nutrition and started getting interested in, you know, um, how food can help, uh, help out with my health. Um, you know, as I was growing up, I had a lot of health problems as a child allergies, asthma, um, you know, a lot of trouble breathing, stuff like that, um, digestive issues. And then, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't really, um, I, I never really found much help at the doctor. So I used food and nutrition as a way to cope with that. And, um, you know, kind of <laughs> take, take my health into my own hands. Um, and then, you know, eventually, when I was looking into college and what I wanted to do, I found the career dietitian. Um, and as I was becoming a dietitian, I started getting, you know, more digestive and gut health issues. Um, so that was where I kind of put my focus into gut health. Um, and then eventually my gut health issues turned into um, some cognitive issues. I was getting really like massive migraines and, um, you know, uh, they wouldn't go away until my digestion returned to normal. Um, so that kind of piqued my interest. And then, you know, I just kind of went down the rabbit hole and decided to focus on this. Um, and going into that led me into like an integrative kind of approach where I just um, integrate, you know, all the different, um, all the different ways that we could help with our health. Um, Eastern, Western medicine, you know, medication, um, traditional doctors, uh, holistic methods, all of that um, are things that I incorporate into um, my approach with this. So yeah, these are my main beliefs. Um, one, gut health. Two, finding the root cause of the issue. And three, the integrative approach. Um, and this little quote here is just um, one I kind of made up. Uh, nutrition is an aspect of health that, that provides an asymmetric opportunity. Um, and basically what that means is just um, there's little downside to making diet changes um, and the benefits that they have for your health could be really um, life-changing. All right. So onto my topic for today, I'm gonna to talk about the gut-brain connection in Parkinson's disease. Um, so why the gut? A few reasons. Um, one, the gut is pretty much the control center of the immune system. Um, about 70 to 80% of the immune system exists in the gut. Um, the gut also has the largest concentration of microbes which are you know, all organisms, bacteria, viruses that help us um, you know, go about our daily lives. Um, yeah, and just to go a little more into that, microbes are like pretty much at the base level of epigenetics. Um, a lot of microbes send signals to our cells to make epigenetic changes. Um, and along with the um, immunity in the gut, also the, 
the opposite side of that autoimmune diseases can occur when the when digestion and some of these um, microbes in the gut are out of balance mm. and some other issues that commonly happen from this inflammation and detoxification issues um, and yeah i'll get into that a little little later um, but the interesting thing about the gut and one of the reasons why it's so unique is because it's actually exposed to the outside world, right? Um, food from the outside world we come in contact with every day. This is why it needs that high concentration of immunity, immune cells in the gut. Um, and kind of like a, a, a way to think about it is um, there's like subways or trains that kind of go under the ocean, right? So the tube under the ocean is in the ocean, but it's not actually exposed to any of the water. This is kind of the same with the gut, how it's inside your body, but it's actually outside and exposed to the outside world. Uh, yeah, so moving on a little more to the gut microbiome. Yeah, so somebody had asked if you could define epigenetics. Uh, yeah, so epigenetics pretty much just like your, I would call your genetics, like the pretty much the blueprint of what is most likely to happen. And epigenetics is what signals what actually happens. So, um, for example, say like someone is born with a gen, like a 80% chance from like due to their genetic makeup that they will get um, like they will have cardiovascular disease. That doesn't mean that they're going to have cardiovascular disease. The epigenetic signals that are sent are what determines if they do. Right. Does that make sense? Awesome. Um, yeah. And two, if you have any questions at the end, um, I'd be more than happy to, to go more into that as well. Mm -hmm. All right, so what makes up the gut microbiome? Um, there's all sorts of organisms in the microbiome. It's not just bacteria. That's what's most commonly talked about, but there's actually bacteria, viruses, fungi. Um, there's even, even pathogens in the gut that don't cause disease, that just exist naturally in the gut. Um, yeah, and the, the probiotic organisms that are commonly talked about, those are the ones that are considered most beneficial for the health um, and they're naturally anti-inflammatory. Um, pathogens are mostly thought of to promote disease and are inflammatory. Um, but overall, these things do exist um, within everyone's gut. It's just all about the balance and how much of each of them exists. Um, so, talking about the balance, dysbiosis is a commonly used term when the microbiome is out of balance. Um, so this, one of the most common things is that you have a lack of diversity of probiotic organisms in the gut. And then that could lead to some of these pathogenic or inflammatory organisms taking over and then producing more inflammation and some more digestive symptoms. Um, so yeah, some of these are excess fermentation can occur, which sometimes leads to, you know, excessive gas, burping or um, bloating. Um, and then also it is linked with affecting mood and cognition. Um, and yeah, it's dysbiosis is known as the most common uh, cause of GI distress. And it is also very prevalent in Parkinson's disease. So how does this all affect the brain? Um, so the gut and the brain, when um, inflammation is increased, the, uh, so when inflammation is increased, it, it not only causes inflammation, in the area that that happens, it could also 
um, travel to other areas of the body. Uh, so short chain SCFAs are short chain fatty acids. Those are anti-inflammatory molecules that are produced by the gut. So when it's out of balance, less of those might be produced and more inflammation can occur. Um, gut permeability, or sometimes known as leaky gut, um, can cause some more inflammatory molecules to escape into the bloodstream. And some of these molecules could be neurotoxic and affect the way the brain works. Um, and then lastly, gut motility. This is just pretty much like regular digestion. Um, there's, there's something called peristalsis in the gut that keeps the gut moving and flowing. Um, like if you think of like a water slide or something, if there's water always flowing down the water slide, then it's always moving. But if there's no water on the water slide and someone tries to go down the slide, you know, they're gonna get stuck, right? So like constipation. Um, so yeah, the reason that's important is because when you're going, having bowel movements or urinating, um, you're releasing toxins when you do that. So if there's no gut motility and that stuff gets backed up, then you could get up a, a backup of toxic materials in the body. And some of those materials could be neurotoxic. Um, yeah, and then continuing on, some of those uh, other neuroactive molecules that are created in the gut are um, GABA, acetylcholine, dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, um, yeah. And then also on the opposite side of that, dysbiosis that I just mentioned um, has been linked to, um, a, well, a lot of neurological conditions, um, but mostly depression, anxiety, and neurodegenerative diseases. So the connection, um, central nervous system secretes cortisol. Uh, if there's, if everything is balanced, then the secretion of cortisol tends to be balanced as well. Um, if things are imbalanced, then that could lead to secreting more cortisol. Um, and remember the connection is in both directions. So the brain communicates with the gut and the gut communicates with the brain. Um, so, and then, yeah, the, some more of the neuro, neuroactive molecules that I was talking about are listed here. Um, but the interesting thing about this connection is that some, um, some studies have estimated that the communication between the gut and the brain is actually about eight, up to 80% communication from the gut to the brain rather than the other way around. Um, so a lot of times we think about the brain is like the control center that's communicating to the whole body and telling it what to do. Um, but in the gut brain connection, you know, again, these are estimations, but up to 80% of the communication is done from the gut to the brain. Yeah, so just a fun fact, another, um, you know, serotonin, up to 95% of that is produced in the gut. And this is also known as the happy hormone. Um, so some of that, uh, you know, the um, relationship between depression and anxiety um, is kind of explained by, by some of this. Um, and two, I'll, I'll go into it a little more, but the importance of serotonin and serotonin receptors in Parkinson's um, is something that could be affected by this as well. Um, yeah, and then just overall, in general, the, um, there's two main nervous system actions. Um, one is sympathetic, known as the fight, flight, or freeze response. The other is parasympathetic, known as the rest and digest response. Um, so when you're in the sympathetic state, the parasympathetic state is not working. When you're in the parasympathetic state, the sympathetic state is not working. Um, and again, when, when thinking about these, it's all about balance between the two. 
Um, the sympathetic is important, you know, it releases cortisol and allows you, like say if there was a car or something and you were in the street, it gives you that, that energy or that signal to get out of the way, right? By that release of cortisol. The parasympathetic releases acetylcholine and that gives you more of a calm or relaxed state. Um, so it kind of like think about um, when you're getting ready for bed or something, it, you know, it allows you to wind down and, and get ready for that. Uh, the reason why this is important in, with the gut and the brain is because this one parasympathetic called rest and digest, it's important to be able to be in that state while you're eating. A lot of times we'll eat and we're watching like an action movie or we're checking our phones or something. And that puts us, that could put us in the sympathetic uh, nervous system, that fight or flight release the cortisol. And that affects that diverts energy away from digesting the food that we're eating into, you know, other resources. And yeah, just the, the overstimulation of sympathetic, I would say, is the most common um, today. So trying to balance out that parasympathetic nervous system when we need it, um, it can be helpful for your digestion. All right. And then, yeah, just, a, just another kind of continuation on what I was talking about. Um, not only does dysbiosis lead to issues with brain health, but issues with brain health lead to dysbiosis. Um, so a lot of times, like I mentioned before, finding the root cause of something, um, if there's something in the brain that is causing issues in the gut, and then that causes issues in the gut to cause issues in the brain, then both of those issues have to be taken care of. Otherwise, it could lead to, you know, kind of like a, um, like a cascade that just progresses things faster. Um, so a little more focus on SIBO and Parkinson's. Um, so if you haven't heard of SIBO, that stands for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Um, it's one of the common, as, as a, in um, addition to dysbiosis, SIBO is one of the common conditions in Parkinson's. Um, it can lead to bloating, excess gas, malabsorption, and motor fluctuations. Um, so what tends to happen when, when SIBO occurs, this could occur for many different reasons, um, but as I was talking about motility before, a lot of the times if motility is disrupted and not, not working well, that can lead to um, some of the bacteria from the large intestine migrating up into the small intestine. And then when that bacteria is in the small intestine, it, the small intestine is not really equipped to deal with that because most of those microbes um, ferment foods and break them down in a different way. And the large intestine is more durable, so it's able to deal with that better. Um, yeah, again, any questions on this, I'll be happy to go further into it um, if you'd like. And then, yeah, another thing with this is the same way that bacteria from the large intestine can migrate into the small intestine, um, it doesn't always stop there they could get into the bloodstream and pretty much migrate to different areas of the body. And then, you know, just like the small intestine, all the other areas of the body aren't as well as equipped to deal with the fermentation as the large intestine. Okay. And then, um, so a little bit more talking about the kind of like root causes a little more. Um, and some contributing factors. These are, this is just a small list, you know, there's tons of contributing factors that can occur. Um, environmental toxicity, physical trauma, genetics, drugs, um, diseases, so like either chronic or acute infections, nutritional deficiencies, mitochondrial insufficiency, um, enzyme deficiencies, unremitting stress, so kind of what I talked about, the activation of the 
um, sympathetic nervous system more than the parasympathetic. Um, and the reason I bring these up is because um, if you're able to identify the, the root cause of some of these symptoms, then that gives you, that, that allows you to understand the best treatments that are most helpful and that can target the most symptoms. Um, it's not always going to be like a, you know, like a, a magical, like, hey, I took care of this and everything went away. It just gives us an understanding of what to target and put resources into that instead of um, just focusing on like one symptom. Um, so a little bit more about detoxification um, and why this is so important, um, especially, especially for the brain. This is important because if the liver is not detoxifying right, there are a lot of neurotoxic um, molecules that could get up into the brain. Um, so, and you know, the gut microbiome is important for this because it pr produces um, anti-inflammatory molecules that could help to, um, what do you call that? Like uh, diffuse that or, um, uh, I, I can't think of the word, um, but yeah, just, just offset it kind of. Um, and then, you know, as I talked about dysbiosis, again, dysbiosis can lead to more inflammation and less detoxification. Um, and some of the, some of the nutritional ways to deal with this is, um, increasing the B vitamins because they're very active in the liver and help with these, uh, detox pathways, um, increasing fiber, you're finding out which fibers uh, that's tolerated so that we keep that motility going and keep the, like allowing the body to naturally um, detox by with urination and bowel movements. Um, yeah. And then just another way, like a common way to, to detox is to just sweat. Um, okay. So going a little more into Parkinson's nutrition, I'm gonna talk about some of the uh, common things that I've seen in some of the studies. Um, so yeah, like I mentioned, dysbiosis, when the gut is balanced, that could equal brain balance. And again, not always, um, you know, working, like, working on finding out what the root cause is, um, is, is crucial in this. Um, cause sometimes there are issues in the brain that may be better, um, dealt with, with a, with a, uh, a doctor that specializes in that. Um, but for the most part, as I mentioned early, um, addressing nutrition is an asymmetric bet. So there's little downside to it and, um, lots of benefits. Um, so one of the, one of the, or two of the common things that have been found to help um, our gluten and dairy-free diets, uh, these can help with the controlling inflammation in Parkinson's and then also the FODMAP diet. Um, so the FODMAP diet, these are foods that ferment. So it stands for fermenta fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. Um, so pretty much FODMAPs are just a group of foods that can cause excess fermentation. And as a dietitian, the way we use that is just working through these different food groups and trying to like, based on the individual, trying to um, see which foods ferment for a beneficial reason versus which ones ferment like, produce excess fermentation and cause painful symptoms and can inhibit motility and stuff in the gut. Um, so yeah, and then, you know, proper nutrition can address food intolerances, find sources of inflammation, um, control symptoms and improve motility. So yeah, one of the, one of the important things is plants in the diet. Um, for fiber recommendations for men, it's about 38 grams. Um, for women, it's about 25 grams. And 
on average, Americans do not consume this. Um, on average, they consume about 26, anywhere from 26 to 68% um, of this recommendation. So anywhere from a quarter of it to almost three quarters of the recommendation. Um, and what that could affect is these uh, fiber in the diet helps you to produce those short chain fatty acids. So with less short chain fatty acids, that can equal more inflammation, um, less, less, uh, less fiber could um, allow some of the probiotic organisms to die off and then lead to dysbiosis as some of the um, inflammatory or um, pathogenic organisms take over. And then, you know, what we see as a symptom is irregular digestion. So a little bit more about high fiber. Um, so good for gut health in general, good for health in general. Um, but in people with dysbiosis, it can be irritating and cause more symptoms. Um, so as a dietitian, what we do is like a nutritional rehabilitation by systematically um, introducing these different food groups, um, seeing if there's any trends with certain food groups, and then um, you know, working in the food groups that don't cause symptoms. And then also um, just because we identify a food as irritating, it doesn't mean we, we get rid of it. Um, we also use methods to slowly introduce it and increase it so that you could tolerate these foods. Um, one of my main goals as a dietitian is to introduce as many foods as possible to get more variety in the diet. And yeah, commonly a lot of times what I see happening is that um, people will remove food groups and then just never, never try it again because it causes symptoms or um, it, it leads to, you know, they have a, a bad response to it in the past. Um, so most of the time, just working through and having these small tweaks where it's like, hey, instead of having, um, instead of adding two cups of spinach today, like let's start from, you know, a quarter cup and work our way up. Just little tweaks like that um, tend to be very helpful. All right. So yeah, kind of talked about this little, but reintroducing fiber slowly, the different food groups, that, for example, um, there's one in garlic called allicillin, and this is also in other sulfur vegetables. So if we're able to identify that intolerance, we could remove that. And then also when we're reintroducing other foods with allicillin, we could slowly try to reintroduce, or if we identify it as an intolerance, then um, stay clear of that. And overall, the goal with all of this is to just build a more diverse microbiome. And that is important because um, studies have shown that health and longevity and a longer lifespan are, uh, is correlated with microbiome diversity. So, um, you know, mo most of the people in the study that lived longer and had, um, had better health overall, had a more diverse microbiome. Oh, sorry. And yeah, so as I talked about why fiber is so important, because it helps to increase the diversity of the microbiome. Um, I know like probiotics are, uh, have been popular recently, but the, the thing is with those is, especially in supplements, there's only a few strains of bacteria that you're getting with those. Um, when, you, when you eat fiber, it increases hundreds of thousands of different strains within the gut naturally. All right, so yeah, a little bit more about that. Do they really work, prebiotics and probiotics? Mm. So probiotics, it has, there have been studies that have shown benefits in Parkinson's disease. As I mentioned though, um, if you're taking a supplement of probiotic, usually like the ones I found the most have like 12 strains. 
Um, and, you know, that compared to the hundreds of thousands of different strains that exist in the gut is just like, you know, a small drop of water uh, in like a big pool, which is your gut microbiome. Um, yeah, so, so most, a lot of the benefits I find is with prebiotics and prebiotic foods um, and being able to tolerate those because they, prebiotics, what they do is feed the probiotics. So it doesn't only um, feed a couple of strains, it feeds all the strains, which allows those probiotics to grow and then, you know, um, help take control of the gut. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And then um, some other important nutrients that I found um, to be beneficial in Parkinson's disease uh, was CoQ10. Um, this was associated with reduced rates of Parkinson's disease, um, deficiencies in vitamin B1 that was found to be correlated with neuroinflammation and neurodegeneration. Um, Omega-3 fatty acids, those have been found to improve motor skills in Parkinson's disease. And then high antioxidants food, these are highly active in the brain and reduce inflammation and oxida oxidation. Um, and then nuts and seeds just in general promote brain health. All right. Um, yeah, I kind of I mentioned a few of these in the last slide, but these are just common deficiencies that are found in Parkinson's disease. Um, CoQ10, vitamin D, omega-3 fatty acids, glutathione, vitamin C, and then the B vitamins. Um, and the B vitamins is really interesting because if they help promote that detox, those detox pathways in the liver. And um, if, if patients are having trouble with detoxification, then B vitamins could kind of uh, supply like a little like, you know, one, two action there. Um, kill two birds with one stone kind of. Um, so yeah, vitamin D, the, why this is so interesting, especially in Parkinson's disease is because um, it has a serotonin dependent mechanism. Um, and in Parkinson's disease, that it, the, the serotonin um, receptor is something that has been found to be um, not as active. So that along with the studies that show that vitamin D and increasing that has shown a positive um, outcome for Parkinson's disease patients especially for ones that are deficient. Um, yeah. And also talking about the gut a little more, um, vitamin D has been found to uh, pro promote that gut microbiome homeostasis um, and increase beneficial bacteria in the gut. Um, a little bit more about omega-3 fatty acids. Um, so for brain function, they've been shown to be beneficial, um, helps to prevent and improve symptoms, um, especially when a lot of inflammation is present. Omega-3 fatty acids are natural, naturally anti-inflammatory. Um, and again, just as with vitamin D, if there's a deficiency in omega-3 fatty acids, then the benefits seen from adding them is greater. And then similar, similar to vitamin D again, also reduces inflammation and increases beneficial organisms. Um, so pattern, are we starting to see a pattern? Um, I think so. All right. Um, so just a little bit more about motility. I brought it up a couple times in this presentation, um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty important in Parkinson's disease because a lot of patients do have decreased motility. Um, and there are some medications that could cause constipation. So improving that motility um, is important, can be important. And then um, some of the, from a nutritional aspect, 
some of the things that that I like to do is, you know, increase the amount of like bitter greens or herbs that stimulate motility in the gut um, to help get things moving. Um, and then spicy foods, you know, not everyone likes spicy foods, but for those who do, that could also help um, stimulate motility in the gut. And not, so I usually refer to the gut mostly, but it's not only in the gut, also your entire digestive system needs motility. So even in the esophagus, um, some patients have problems with dysphagia. This could increase motility in the esophagus all throughout the, all throughout the gut. And then, yeah, another thing that, that helps with motility, exercise, just moving, get, getting moving, um, kind of stimulates motility all throughout the digestive system. Um, because it's kind of signal, like when you're moving, you're signaling your body that you need to replete that energy. So it's preparing for more food pretty much. Mm -hmm. All right, on to what I focus on. Mm -hmm. So yeah, a little bit more about the root cause. Um, here's just a little, little picture about you know the symptoms being above ground and then the problems being below ground and kind of <laughs> analyzing that and finding out these causes to um, take care of the symptoms right so for example if the symptoms if we're um, always con controlling the symptoms it's just like we're trimming the trees right um, but we're not dealing with the actual roots. So it's just gonna, the trees is gonna keep growing back. Um, so yeah, this identifies the most prevalent issue. And when that issue is resolved, it will either um, resolve or improve all of the other symptoms. All right. And also, as I mentioned before, um, it helps us to identify treatment options that um, not only focus on one symptom, but can attack multiple if we're focusing on that root cause. All right, just a little, you know, a little something I drew up before uh, some of these similar to the tree, like the iceberg of what we see um, is just a little bit compared to what what is underneath. Um, as you can see, like dysbiosis, infections, a few of the things that I mentioned here that could be contributing to the autoimmunity. And taking care of those things could either, um, and this is not, not always going to like reverse it or improve it. Um, sometimes just maintain it or reduce the symptoms. Mm. So yeah, again, some of these that I already mentioned, the toxic exposures, um, food intolerances, uh, low chronic low-grade infections, um, traumatic brain injuries, stress. Again, that that's just a really important one with the, uh, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system and trying to reduce that cortisol production as much as we can. And then dysbiosis. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is just something that I like to think of when I'm thinking about health, um, the different levels of health, right? As I mentioned earlier, the, uh, when someone asked a question about epigenetics, um, so I like to, I like to think about health on these different levels, right? And what, what level are we currently, um, what level are we currently treating, right? So for example, anatomical, if someone broke their arm, um, <laughs> me trying to focus on the, their microbiology is probably gonna do little for them, right? They might need a cast or they might need surgery, right? Um, same, in the same way, if there's an imbalance or dysbiosis in the microbiome, me trying to focus on, you know, um, fixing the, the physical uh, symptoms, right? Is, is not gonna show as much benefit, right? Um, yeah. And that just, so the microbi microbiological level, like I mentioned before, the, the epigenetic, because it helps produce molecules 
that signal what your genetic blueprint, um, what the outcome is for it. Um, yeah, and then, you know, any more questions? I'll be happy to talk about that. Mm. And then, you know, what most, what most of my patients tell me, like, hey, can you just tell me what to eat? Like, so let me, let me get into that a little bit. Um, so, you know, some of the, some of the things we do, like the, the resources we have is, for example, a lot of, a lot of patients will, you know, it, it'll be super stressful for them. Um, so a lot of them will like, you know, I give them a resource with these different food groups, protein, leafy greens, grains, starchy vegetables, uh, vegetables and good fats. And then, so there's a list of foods for each. And then I'll just give them, you know, how many servings to have for each meal. Um, so when it comes to mealtime, it's not so overwhelming. It's just, oh, how many of this do I have? Two. Okay, let me pick two foods from that, right? Um, and then, you know, also like working and to developing like a grocery list so that we have all these things, stuff like that to try to reduce the, the stress when it comes to mealtimes. Mm -hmm. Um, Joseph, for just giving you a time check. Okay. We have about a little over 15 minutes left. So just time check. That's all. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, yeah. And then, you know, this kind of the, I already went over the importance of, of vegetables. Um, so we just, you know, provide some easy, quick options and ideas for on the go. Um, this, okay. This is this is very important. Um, herbs, right? The forgotten powerhouse. Um, we used to use a lot of herbs in cooking. They're very nutrient dense. They have antipathogenic properties. Um, they regulate the metabolism. Um, but what has happened is we've been using a lot more sauces, a lot more um, things come packaged already flavored. So we're getting that decrease in natural flavor. Um, and with that, we're missing out on all this nutrient density, the anti-pathogenic anti effects and regulating our metabolisms. Um, so yeah, just some, some convenient ways that you could incorporate herbs here. Um, and again, you'll get a copy of these slides. So if you wanna look more at that, you can. Um, yeah. This just explaining a little bit, a little bit deeper about what, what I talked about. Um, so antibiotics, antibiotics versus some herbal like antibiotics, pretty much. Um, antibiotics are good, you know, they work, they clear bacterial infections. Um, and if that pathogen is causing digestive issues, then it could lead to better digestion. Um, herbs, on the other hand, are not as um, powerful as antibiotics, but they don't just target bacteria. They could target um, parasites, they could target um, viruses, they could target bacteria. So it's, it's a more gentle on the gut microbiome, um, but can have similar effects to antibiotics. And again, based on the individual situation, it's just all about finding that balance. Mm. All right, uh, mindful meal. So as I had mentioned earlier, the uh, parasympathetic nervous system is very important to stimulate during meals because it gets you in that rest and digest state and allows you to digest properly. Um, again, here's some tips you could, you'll have these slides, you could look at that if you'd like to a little reminder of some of the actions of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Um, yeah, again, just some tips, like if you are stressed before going into eating, um, you know, you could take a minute and just take like three to five breaths, slow things down, check in before you start the meal. Um, and then, yeah, if you participate in stressful eating, you know, there's some simple questions you could ask just before we're taking part in that and just um, causing those triggers to be even more stressful. All right. Um, so integrative, so just overall, uh, kind of this is 
a little bit of the framework for, for a lot of digestive issues. Um, so if there is something like a pathogen present, then removing that with antibiotics, herbs um, is, is the first step. Restoring motility to the gut, which we talked about a lot, and then increasing that diversity with, with prebiotics or fiber. And some of the some of the things that could be helpful during this process um, to help like alleviate the symptoms, um, you know, adding digestive enzymes, probiotics, um, anything to help like ease digestion while we're trying to improve it. Okay, yeah, I kind of talked about this already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then you know. What, what, what I do as a dietitian, um, my whole goal is to increase diversity in the diet. Um, the, the goal is not to remove foods and just get rid of them forever. Um, the goal is to, you know, there might be some foods that, are, that you're intolerant to, um, but we want to, we want to make sure that we're getting the most variety into the diet as possible. Okay. Um, yeah, so again, I, I talked about the integrative approach. Um, I'm part of a care team. So, you know, sometimes if uh, something is out of my scope, we have different, you know, people that we like to refer to, um, to, to help with that. Um, and then I also have other dietitians that I work with that have different specialty. Joseph, uh, we have uh, a few people who've asked questions. Okay. I want to make sure, uh, or let's focus on this and segue from this slide, which has your contact information. Into yeah. <laughs> you yeah. leaving a little time for questions and answers. Okay. Got it. Yeah. So that's pretty much it. Just um, here's, so the top website is mine. Um, the second website is the team of dietitians that I work with. Um, and then the phone number is where you can get in contact with us. And these are all of the resources. Oh. Uh, okay. Oh, I guess I clicked on one of them. <laughs> um, yeah, but that's that's pretty much it. Okay, let's then uh, go back to uh, gallery view, and we have one of the questions that's been asked, chatted in, is how do you measure gut motility? Uh, so you know, pretty much by like symptoms and how uh, how regularly you're using the the restroom, right? Um, that's the easiest way. Also, sometimes if there's ex, like constipation, um, excess gas could be another way to um, target that or to identify that. Uh, yeah, basically the, so that's another thing is um, when working with patients, I do a very extensive uh, like questionnaire to, tr to try to figure these things out. Um, but most of the time, it will either be um, constipation or diarrhea. Okay, if you have a question, unmute yourself. And the simple rule is don't talk over each other, but raise your hand, wave if you're having a question and you can't seem to unmute yourself and feel free to ask your own questions. Like I'm going to the supermarket tomorrow, what do I buy? <laughs> Well, one question that did get chatted in was, uh, you talked about a dairy-free diet. Does that include yogurt? Um, <laughs> so it wouldn't, usually what, what would happen is we would cut it out for a short amount of time and then try to reintroduce it. Um, so yeah, if it was dairy-free, then it would, there, and there are other different types of yogurt that you could, you could use like coconut or almond or cashew milk yogurt. They have some good ones. 
Um, but yeah, it would, the whole goal would be to remove it for a short period of time and then reintroduce it and see how, see how you do with it. Or are there any other questions? All right, you had talked about herbs. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had people specifically ask about the value of turmeric. Can mm -hmm. you comment on that? Oh uh, yeah, turmeric's great. Um, it's anti-inflammatory. So a lot of these, a lot of people with, with issues in the gut um, or neuroinflammation, there is some inflammation there. Um, so yeah, it could, the, you know, curcumin and turmeric is anti-inflammatory and it could help to decrease some of that. Um, and that's, that's something that, that, you know, could be used to help mitigate the inflammation. Um, but like I mentioned, the root cause, finding that the source of inflammation could help to prevent it, you know, um, more in the future. Are there any other questions? Are you available, Joseph, if people have questions by email about their own shopping list or their own diet, etc.? Oh, yeah. My so my email, you can contact me at gut health nutrition. at gmail.com. And just a note, folks, when we post this on the website on our YouTube channel, we'll also post Joseph's slides and we'll make sure that we post uh, Joseph's contact information and websites. So you'll be able to follow up if you'd like. You know, you'll be able not only to rewatch the presentation or skip through it to parts that you enjoy, uh, but you'll also be able to look at specific slides because a lot of them are very information rich. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you for uh, checking in too at the time because <laughs> could probably talk for four hours. Uh, <laughs> All right, people talk about plant-based diets. I've had people uh, mm -hmm. ask uh, that question in groups I've been in. Uh, so could you reiterate what the importance of a plant-based diet is and its oh. relationship and how much protein you might have in that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, some of the other dietitians I work with uh, do are fully... Uh, Veg vegetarian not vegan but vegetarian mm -hmm. um but i work with you know i work with both people that do have animal products and don't um but the the important thing is how much plants are you having right um like the the one slide i had about the fiber recommendation mm -hmm. um, most people don't get like even half of that right um, and that's important for pretty much everything we talked about today, motility, um, the diversity of the gut microbiome, right? Um, so yeah, uh, plant-based diet, the way, you know, some people think it means vegetarian or vegan. Um, it just means that, you know, the majority of what you're having is from plants, right? Um, and uh, for the uh, people that are vegetarians that want to get protein, um, again, the, the other dietitians I work with, um, they have a ton of resources on that. Um, and they themselves, you know, <laughs> really um, know how to incorporate a lot of protein um, and haven't had any issues with that.
Okay, one last thing, uh, you'd raise the issue of inflammation. You just briefly restate the role of inflammation vis-a-vis uh, -vis Parkinson's disease. Yeah, so in a lot of um, autoimmune diseases, it's speculated that inflammation is the cause, right? Um, so, you know, for example, like arthritis, neurodegenerative diseases. Um, and <laughs> pretty, yeah, so the, the fr from like my <laughs> my specialty the reason why i like to focus on the gut is because it's so it's got such a dense population of micro microbes that either produce anti-inflammatory molecules or inflammatory molecules right um so that balance i talked about right you know if you're producing more inflammatory molecules and less anti-inflammatory molecules, um, it could lead to all sorts of different autoimmune diseases. Um, and I'm not I'm not 100% sure on Parkinson specifically in the role of inflammation, um, but with most autoimmune diseases, um, inflammation is is present. Well, Joseph, that brings us to it's just about one o'clock, which is typically when we end. Uh, this has been an excellent presentation. I want to remind people that uh, if you're on our mailing list, you'll be notified uh, when the video gets posted. And also when the link goes up on our meetings page for a PDF of this presentation. Uh, You'll also always be able to find this on the Parkinson's of PNMD website under the meetings page. You'll see a link to the video. So if you ever misplace it, you can always go to the PNMD website, click on meetings, and you'll see a link to the video. And that video will be posted within the next 48 hours. So we typically get it up pretty quickly. And then if you have any questions, as Joseph has said, you can email them to Joseph. So, well, this has been a presentation of the Parkinson Network of Mount Diablo with the gracious participation of registered dietitian Joseph Bartoloni. Bartoloni, excuse me for mispronouncing that. <laughs> no problem. Um, you actually did a good job. Most people say Bartoloni. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I want to thank you and thank you for all of you who have participated and remained here through the presentation. And we started off with about 38 people, just FYI. But oftentimes, you know, that number goes up by an order of magnitude as people start to view it online. So thank you. And that will end today's Lunch and Learn seminar. Awesome. Thank you, Rick. You're welcome. And if you have any questions, you can always email me, president at pnmd.net. I'm always happy to respond.